Okay, um, welcome everybody. Um, I'm Phil Tomlinson from the School of Management. Um, and welcome to this IPR sponsored event this evening on, on Brexit, um, UK automotive industry, and implications for industrial policy. I think it's um, quite an appropriate time to hold this event. Parliament has returned this week from its summer recess and now has to pick up the pieces from the referendum results in the summer. The new Prime Minister has been quite clear. She said that Brexit means Brexit. But I think that catchphrase is beginning to wear a little bit thin at the moment, and, and even with some of her own backbenchers. I think people want to know what Brexit actually means. And I think this, you know, in the next few months, we're going to get closer to understanding what sort of deal the UK is going to get. So there's quite a lot of uncertainty about at the moment. And um, I believe there are about seven different versions of Brexit on the table. So, uh, or, and some are more palatable than others, depending on your taste. For business, it's particularly important that you know, they're making decisions on investment and jobs, and they need reassurances and assurances about trade and our future relationship with the European Union. And already this week, the Prime Minister has received a letter from the Japanese, as you, you may well be aware, warning about what Japanese firms might be like, like to do in the future, about shifting their UK headquarters onto the continent in the short term, and possibly in the longer term, the manufacturing op operations um, to, to continental Europe, unless there is guaranteed access to the single market and free movement of labour. Well, tonight, you know, and to talk about these issues, I'm delighted to welcome an old friend and, and colleague, uh, I should say, Professor David Bailey, here at the front here, um, from the University of Aston. Uh, the focus of his talk is the automotive industry, which some of you may be surprised to hear, others not, has been one of the star performers, one of the few star performers in the UK economy in recent years. A bit about David. He's a professor of industrial strategy at the Uni University of Aston. He's written extensively on industrial and regional policy, especially in relation to manufacturing and the automotive industry. His recent research has been funded by a number of states and, and private organizations. For instance, he was the area coordinator on industrial policy for the FP7 project, Welfare, um, Welfare, Wealth and Work for Europe, and is now participating in the Horizon 2020 RISE project called <coughs> Makers. He's a regular newspaper columnist and media commentator. I believe he's done about 2,000 <coughs> media interviews in the last decade. Okay, and um, he was also previously chair of the Regional Studies <coughs> Association and is deputy ed chief editor of the leading journal in the field, Regional Studies, as well as an editor of Policy Studies and the Journal of Industry, Competition and Trade. So ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome for, for Professor David Bailey. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure there. Thank you. I'll put this on now. Shall I? Great. Thank you very much and, and nice to, to meet you all. And a big thank you to the IPR for organising this event. Um, the focus today is going to be very much about the auto industry in particular and implications of Brexit for industrial policy. Um, but what I thought I would do... Oops, I've messed that up already. There we go. Is um, do a bit of background on the debates that took place during the referendum in terms of uh, you know, impact of leaving on the economy, on employment and so on, just to remind us of some of the debates that we had or rather didn't have. I was also told as well there wouldn't just be academics here and students but also people from uh, business and the wider community. I thought it might be useful to do a quick recap of what some of the discussions were about, partly because what we were promised in total is not going to be achievable. So there's going to be some important trade-offs between different elements of what Brexit has pro promised us. And depending on what package we eventually end up with, that's going to have some quite important implications for different sectors, uh, particularly those that trade internationally. So I thought what I'd do before getting on to the auto industry and implications for industrial policy, I thought I'd talk a little bit about the debates that took place in terms of the costs and benefits of EU membership for the UK, in terms of trade, investment and jobs, what the impact of leaving might be. A bit of discussion about regulation, seeing as those in favour of Brexit focused on this very much in terms of being able to reduce so-called red tape 
and uh, free up business. Touch very briefly on immigration, the, the fiscal aspect that was so prominent uh, during the debate, and then finally get on to automotive. So I'm going to do a kind of quick, uh, quick Cook's tour through the economic side of the debate that we've been through uh, during the referendum, and then sort of spell out some of the consequences for automotive and industrial policy. Feel free, by the way, to stop me as we go along. Stop me and buy one. If anything isn't clear or you want to ask a question, it's much more fun that way. Um, lots of sources. I'll make the slides available. So if anybody's interested in following up, there's some great sources available at the UK and the Changing Europe website. That's an ESRC-funded initiative. We got funding from them to run various events on what Brexit will mean for automotive, for example. Um, also, the House of Commons Library has some great reports on the potential impact of Brexit. Uh, I'm also going to be drawing on some research on, done by the Economic and Social Research Institute in Ireland. Now, this government g gives the impression that they haven't really prepared for Brexit, partly because they probably never expected to actually have a referendum or even win it. Ireland has been hugely concerned about Brexit for several years, given that the UK is its biggest trading partner, so I've done a lot of research on what the likely impact of Brexit is. I want to refer to some of that as we go along. So, the first thing that we, I want to focus on is the costs and benefits of EU membership. If you remember, during the campaign, the different sides put out very different figures. So the Remain camp said that they referred to uh, work by the Confederation of British Industry, that trade investment jobs at lower prices coming from membership of the EU is worth £3,000 for every household. The Leavers said that the EU costs on average UK household over £9,000 a year. Both of them can't be right, so which is correct. First thing to bear in mind is that membership of the EU is impacted on different ways, on different industries, different regions, and therefore different households. So some will have benefited from EU membership, others will have lost out. So this household idea actually isn't very good at all. So as soon as you see a cost or benefit for a household, ignore it. It doesn't really mean very much. The first one, £3,000 a year benefit of EU membership, is incredible. Uh, Jonathan Portes at the UK and the Changing Europe website has sort of taken this apart. That figure came from loads of different studies done at different points in time, analysing different things with different methodologies designed to answer different questions. Some of it wasn't even about the UK. So there's no credibility in terms of that figure. The £9,000 a year cost figure, um, here the argument is, and it comes really from work of, of a group, the one group of economists who were in favour of exit, economists for Brexit, a uh, prominent leader of that was Patrick Minford, some of you will be familiar with. They argued that actually... EU membership reduces the value of uh, GDP in the UK economy by about 13%. There were some massive assumptions behind that, many of which were totally unrealistic. So, for example, they assumed that on leaving the EU, the UK would remove all barriers to trade with the rest of the world, no tariff barriers at all, and abolish all EU regulations, for example, on the environment and when it comes to the labour market. That ain't going to happen. So that figure doesn't actually stack up either. And even if it did happen... The benefits probably wouldn't be that high anyway. In some areas, in fact, we've gone further than EU regulations. So if you think, for example, about the extra taxes that we've put onto UK manufacturers to try and meet our greenhouse gas sort of targets in terms of climate change, we've gone further than the EU and we've chosen to do that. Now, that figure also involves some pretty arbitrary and unsubstantiated claims as regards the fact that the UK would contribute to bailing out other nations within the EU. Uh, Gisela Stewart, my MP and a prominent leaver, said this often during the campaign. And I think one of my great regrets in life is that in the previous life I was her press officer and campaign manager. And I thought, what have I done? But um, <laughs> So there's this claim that if we stayed in, we would be bailing out other countries. There is no rationale for that at all, and there's no obligation to do so. The UK did choose to lend money to Ireland to help them through a different situation, difficult situation, but that was in part because Ireland is a major trading partner of the UK. And in fact, we made money on lending money to them. I think we were charging something like 6% a year. So actually, we chose to do that. There's no, there's no obligation to do so. So what can we say? Again, come back to the UK and the change in Europe. So far, all the evidence suggests that the EU membership has made the UK's economy bigger and more open. Uh, the Bank of England has said that EU membership has increased openness to flows of trade, investment and labour. That in turn has helped the economic growth and has improved living standards. Although, like other, other economies that have opened up, we are more vulnerable to financial and economic shocks from overseas. Nick Crafts, the famous um, economic historian at LSE, suggests that past EU membership has increased UK productivity 
and therefore the total size of the economy, by about 10%. In other words, the best guess we can make is that by having been a member of the EU since the early 1970s, we are 10% more productive and richer than we would have been otherwise. However, that doesn't mean to say that staying in will mean that will continue. So if economists are right that EU membership boosted growth in the past, there's no guarantee it will do so in the future. But that's probably the most we can say. Now, the impact of the Leave vote is really going to depend, in this context, on this particular aspect, on two things. Firstly, the trading arrangements between the UK and remaining EU countries, those are now going to have to be negotiated. And the economic policies adopted by the UK government after we leave. That means there's a range of different possible outcomes. However, most economists, in fact nearly all economists, apart from that group economists for Brexit, think that leaving will come with some economic cost. FT did a survey of 100 economists earlier this year. Three quarters thought that leaving will reduce the size of the economy. Uh, you know, economists are faving, fav famous for saying, on the other hand, uh, and for disagreeing even with themselves. But there is a strong consensus view that leaving will produce an economic shock. Less than one in 10 thought it would improve growth prospects. Three interesting studies that were published independently, as well as the work that's been done by the IMF, the OECD, the Treasury, and others. So the Center for Economic Performance, uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, and Oxford Economics, all the reports that were all done early this year. All three found that leaving will have some negative impact on the UK economy compared to staying in. Now, the impact of leaving, and therefore the economic cost to the UK, is smaller that the, the closer any new arrangement is to our current economic relationship with the European Union. So estimates of the cost of leaving range from close to zero in one model if we stay in the single market, allow free movement of, la of labor and so on, to significantly negative if leaving results in substantial new barriers to trade and difficulties in hiring skilled labor. Remember, during the campaign, the Treasury thought that by 2030, the UK would probably be about 6% smaller if we were to leave. Similar sorts of figures from the OECD and IMF. That, that, that um, prompted, of course, uh, Michael Gove's comment that we're fed up of hearing from experts. Um, National Institute for Economic and Social Research thinks that GDP could be between 1.5 and 7.8% lower by 2030. Again, depending on the nature of the trading relationships. But what's important? is that they, they point to this potential for a substantial loss of export trade. So depending on the trading relationship we have, if we lose the ability to export and therefore also lose the ability to attract in investment, the economic costs are going to be greater. What about the impact on trade, investment and jobs then, following on from that? We know that 45% of UK exports go to the EU. There's roughly a trillion pounds worth of foreign direct investment in the UK, and depending on how you measure it, between 46% and 50% of that comes from the EU. Now, we often hear from Brexiters that, well, Germany sells us more cars than we sell them, therefore they'll want a trade deal. That is the case. However, when you put it into the broader picture, UK trade with the EU accounts for 12% of our GDP. EU trade with the UK only accounts for 2% of Europe's GDP. In other words, our trade with Europe is much more important to us than their trade with us. So when it comes to doing a trade deal, there's more pressure on us to get a, a deal done than for the rest of Europe. And that asymmetry was never really recognized during the referendum campaign. Also, by the way, any deal that's got to be done has got to be agreed by 27 different countries and other actors, as well as just Germany. So there's a huge amount of trade risk here and uncertainty. And I'll come back to the uncertainty later, as that's got great potential to impact on foreign investment, particularly in the auto industry. About 50% of our trade is at stake. There's no guarantee of what a post-exit trade deal will look like. We've also got to remember that there are significant trade deficits from the UK with countries like China, Norway, Japan, and Canada, which might also get worse depending on the nature of the trade deals that we do with them. There are certain sectors especially at risk. Automotive is one of them, but financial services is also flagged up. So I'll talk more about auto in a moment. And remember, during the campaign, President Obama came over and said, 
the US focus. It's something he reiterated at the G20 uh, last week. The US is focused on doing a uh, trade deal with a big bloc like the EU, get to the back of the queue. There was a warning from the IMF during the campaign that we might not be able to do what the economists for Brexit suggest, which is leave, cut tariffs uh, completely, and open up to world trade in that way. And uh, just the final pedantic point, we do actually need to check whether we are members of the WTO, because when the WTO was created, we gained membership through the European Union. So it's not actually clear we are a member of the WTO. Um, so this idea that somehow at the end of a two-year Article 50 period we revert to WTO rules, well, there's even an uncertainty over that. What are the trading options outside the EU? We heard a number of them during the campaign. In fact, the Brexiters went through them sort of one by one, and as objections were put up, they moved on to another one. Uh, one of them that's referred to is Norway. So Norway is part of the European Economic Area. If we were to follow, th follow this example, we'd gain access to the single market in return for a price. There's a financial contribution that Norway makes into European budgets. That's approximately a third per capita of what we currently pay in the UK. They also have to accept European regulations with no say over, over how they are formed and free labour mobility. You can see straight away that's going to be difficult to the likes of Liam Fox and others uh, and Theresa May who want to restrict immigration. Switzerland was also flagged up as a possibility. Um, There's a similar sort of outcome, but it's done in a very different way here. Uh, here, Switzerland negotiates trade deals on a sector-by-sector -sector basis. Now, we might do something similar. Again, they make a financial contribution. Again, it's roughly a third per person of what we pay in the UK to European budgets, and they have to accept free labour mobility. Now, many of you will be aware that in 2014, the Swiss voted in a referendum to restrict immigration. That put them on a collision course with the European Commission, and they were effectively kicked out of Horizon 2020, for example. On the back of that, Switzerland has had to back off and agree to maintaining free uh, labour mobility. The Swiss deal doesn't cover many financial services. So if we were to do a Switzerland, we'd have to go well beyond it in terms of adding in uh, areas that would affect in particular financial services in the city. Uh, a third one that was referred to was Turkey. Um, here, the UK would enter a customs union with the EU, allowing access to the free market in manufactured goods. That isn't the same as the single market. And I think one of my criticisms of those in favour of Brexit is that they never really differentiated between um, free trade area, customs union, single market. They are different. Free trade area simply means not having tariff barriers on trade in manufactured goods. Customs union then applies a common external tariff. The single market was about eliminating non-tariff barriers and bringing in services. So Turkey simply has a trade deal on manufactured goods. Doesn't include services, doesn't include financial services, doesn't include non-tariff barriers. They can be subject to anti-dumping measures and all sorts of things. So it's very restricted market access. Finally, if we were to go down a unilateral approach, so suppose we activate Article 50 and at the end of it there isn't a trade deal, we revert to WTO rules. Now, WTO rules at the moment allow substantial trade tariffs. In the case of automotive, as much as 10%. In the case of automotive components, 4%. In other industries, they can be even higher. I'll come back to automotive later. But suppose that we didn't agree a trade deal, and two years in, we're into WTO rules. 10% tariff barrier would probably wipe out the mass automotive industry in the UK. The premium end of things would probably survive, but the mass players, I think, would struggle to cope with that. So we're likely to end up with less than free trade. Now, the outcome of negotiations is very difficult to predict, in part because I don't think the British government even knows what it wants yet, but we don't know also how our partners in Europe will react to it. Um, if we went for a, a Norway-style solution, that implies de facto EU membership without the ability to shape policies. I can't see that being acceptable to the British government. And it's entirely possible that trade relations will be less free than they are now. You can't actually get better than free trade. Now, that implies changes in the trade relationship between the UK and the EU and also potential impact on investment, which I'll come back to later. Interestingly, the IFS, the Institute of Fiscal Studies, suggests that leaving the single market, not leaving the EU, but leaving the single market could impact on GDP by the order of 4% by 2030. Now, the next slides are taken from the Economic and Social Research Institute in Ireland. They've been studying disintegration. We often study economic integration. Very few people study economic disintegration. What happens when economic units separate? What's the impact on trade, uh, investment, and other things? 
They've studied various examples. Some of them may seem less relevant, but as I go on, some will become more relevant. So, for example, um, <coughs> Algeria used to be part of France, in fact, until 1958, and it was part of France. It wasn't a colony, it was part of France. They then separated. In 1958, 85% of Algerian exports went to France, 20% of French exports went to Algeria. The fact of separation, even though they had a trade deal, led to substantially less trade between each other proportionately in terms of over overall trade. When Greenland left the EU, and that's one example of a country leaving the EU that we could look at, again, the important thing here is the red line. This is trade with the EU minus Denmark, because they were still integrating with Denmark through a trade deal. Uh, exports are, are from Green, Greenland to the EU as a proportion of overall exports fell from something like 30% down to 5%. A much more recent example is Czech Slovak breakup. So Czechoslovakia broke up in the early 90s. Many in that country regret that now. Um, at that point, something like 35 to 40% of Slovak exports went to the Czech side. Over 20% of Czech exports went to the Slovak side. Now, even though they both then ended up joining the EU and they entered a free trade area, they started to diverge in terms of things like regulations and also started to trade with other people. So their trade with each other declined substantially as a proportion of overall trade. What does all that mean? It suggests that if there are barriers to trade with the EU as a proportion of overall trade, we will trade less with the EU. That is also likely to impact on investment in the UK. One study suggests that EU membership increases trade by about 20% compared to a bilateral trade agreement. So even if we end up with a trade agreement of sorts, that is likely to mean proportionally less trade with the EU than before. What about the impact on jobs of leaving? Again, claims over jobs need to come with a health warning. Leavers argue that when we leave, we'll free companies of EU regulations and red tape. Small pump companies will benefit the most. Remainers say that millions of jobs will be lost as global manufacturers might move to other countries. Car industry is flagged up and financial services in particular. One of the figures that was often produced during the referendum campaign was three million jobs at risk. Yeah. Just uh, just for clarification, in the previous slide, you were saying that the disintegration has led to the reduction in the export proportion. As proportion of the importation. Yeah. Does, does overall levels may go up or down, but as a proportion of overall trade, there's a shift. I mean, the proportion of their overall trade with respect to their own, the, the two two countries. Yep. Yeah. Come back to that later. Um, it was claimed during the campaign three million jobs depend on EU membership. Um, that's not true, really. Um, there are probably three million jobs in the UK linked to trade with the EU. Not all of those are going to disappear. Best estimates suggest hundreds of thousands of jobs may go, depending on the type of trade relations that are put in place with the EU. And that argument that if we uh, leave the EU, we can deregulate the economy and therefore create loads of jobs, I'm skeptical about that. The majority of laws are likely to remain the same unless there's a bonfire of labour rights. And as I said, the UK has gone further in many areas than the EU. Think about environmental policy, for example. Um, on regulation, it was claimed by leavers that there's a big cost to business of regulation. The EU has got power to regulate in a number of areas that affect business. So we think about product specifications, competition, employment rights, health and safety, consumer protection. British Chambers of Commerce put the cost of that to British business at about 7.6 billion a year. That's probably about right. That isn't saying there's a cost to the overall economy, though, because there's a welfare transfer to others in the economy. So if you benefit from labour protection, you are benefiting as a worker, there's a cost for the company. If you are benefiting from consumer rights legislation, because if you've bought a faulty product, you can take it back, you gain welfare as against the company. Open Europe, which is hardly a pro-European think tank, argues that the benefit-cost ratio of EU regulations is about 1.02. In overall, there is a net welfare benefit for the UK of European regulations. Now, the net benefit is slightly less than the UK's own regulations, but nevertheless, there's a welfare transfer and an overall benefit. As I said, EEA members accept the vast bulk of European regulations, and there is actually a trade-off, I think, between national sovereignty and the sort of integration and harmonization needed to achieve free trade. There's been work done, for example, by the Centre for Economic Policy Research 
uh, on transatlantic trade, which suggests, for example, that regulatory differences between North America and Europe in automotive are equivalent to tariff barriers of 26%. So if you can harmonize regulations, you're actually making trade a lot easier. So that's absolutely important. Uh, Martin Wolf in the Financial Times uh, argued, points to work by the OECD showing actually the UK is one of the most deregulated economies in the OECD. The strong performance of our labor market supports that. So there isn't a regulation issue is the key point. The main obstacles to our economic performance and competitiveness are really around poor education, low investment in, inv in capital and research and development. They're homegrown problems. Okay? Those are things that we haven't got right ourselves. Uh, fourth point, very quickly on immigration. Um, Leavers said that the UK would regain control of its borders. UKIP wanted a uh, points sy system uh, whereby EU nationals would face the same visa restrictions as those from outside the EU. Whether or not that would reduce numbers, of course, was never really explored properly in the referendum campaign. Prime Minister May now appears to have dismissed this in the sense that that wouldn't be tough enough, uh, which in turn raises the question about, well, if we are going to go for a very tough immigration system, what would that mean for our access to the single market? There's also, ironically, going back to the last point, if we go for a visa system whereby anybody coming from the EU to the UK now has to get a visa like somebody coming in from non-EU countries, that's going to add significant burdens to business in terms of the cost of actually applying for and getting visas. Uh, Remainers have argued that if we want to get access to the single market, we would have to keep free movement of labour. And certainly there's, there's been no evidence so far that European partners will, will be willing to move on this, despite what May was saying in Parliament today. And just one final point on that, the UK growth forecasts that the Chancellor came out with last year are based in large part on continued levels of net in migration. Most of the economic growth we've seen since 2009 has been largely driven by migration. Our per capita GDP levels have been pretty static. Uh, final point before I get onto automotive is about the budget. Uh, Leavers would say we'd save loads of money by not being in the EU. Remainers argue actually it's pretty insignificant. We're not going to save that much money. You remember the famous bus that went around. I think Greenpeace have bought this, haven't they? And have sort of <laughs> painted it out and said time to tell the truth or something. Um, Leavers said that remember that the uh, cost of the EU uh, of our, our contribution to the EU is 350 million pounds a week. That was the gross figure, 18 billion pounds a year. But you need to add in the rebate, of course, which is taken off before we pay anything, and receipts that we get back. That gives a net cost of about 8.5 billion, 160 million a week. Remember, as well as I've said, Norway and Switzerland pay in to the European budgets about a third of what we pay in per person to get access to the single market. So if we do want a single market agreement, it's not clear that we do, but if we do, we would have to pay anyway. So the net saving is getting smaller and smaller. Interestingly, again, this wasn't really covered in the referendum. The National Audit Office uses a different formula to calculate the cost of EU membership, whereby they also add in, uh, in terms of money coming back, not only money going to agriculture or regional policy, but money that comes, for example, to private companies through Horizon 2020, Tens of millions of Horizon 2020 money, for example, has gone to the auto industry in recent years, and money that comes to universities to fund our research, where we've been hugely successful. I've just been out in Singapore on a secondment funded by a Horizon 2020 project. Now, when you add all of those things in, our net contribution comes down to about 5.7 billion a year. If you think we're going to have to anyway pay in to get access to the single market, the net overall saving at best might be 3 billion a year. Actually, it's peanuts compared to the benefit of access to the single market. So that financial argument, I think, was completely spurious. OK, moving on now, having gone through the sort of these broader debates, what about the auto industry? There's been a remarkable degree of consensus in the industry about the, the desire to stay in the EU. So surveys by the Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders found 80% of people they surveyed in the industry keen to stay in. A number of reasons for that. One is about access to the single market. Um, single market is our biggest market for export. So 57% of cars exported from the UK go to Europe. Uh, we've attracted huge investment into the UK by car companies, which then use the UK as a base to serve the single market. Secondly, the ability to shape regulations. 
And far from seeing regulations as something that's handed down from Europe, the UK has been very active and successful in the auto industry in shaping those regulations to benefit industries located here. So if we think, for example, about the emissions directive, which puts in place tough penalties for companies that continue to produce gas guzzling cars that emit lots of pollutions that affect greenhouse warming, the UK was very successful in shaping those to minimise the cost of the likes of Jaguar Land Rover. Or you take what's called single type approval, whereby lots of small companies in the UK, little sports car manufacturers like Westfield or Aston Martin, are able to access markets all over the world. They don't have to meet regulatory requirements in each country. They sim simply get single type approval at a European level and therefore can sell into economies all over the world. When that goes, they're going to face major major regulatory barriers in exporting to many markets. So we've actually been hugely successful at shaping regulations. I should also add that many European regulations are adopted around the world. So if you look at European regulations on emissions, they've been largely taken by the Chinese, translated and then applied. So we've managed to shape regulations that have been used not only in Europe but also in China. We're now effectively walking away from the table. And that, I would argue, puts German manufacturers at a significant advantage in terms of the premium sector in particular. Jaguar Land Rover is going to have to look to Slovakia to represent it when it comes to negotiations because they're building a big plant in Slovakia. One of the arguments I'd argue why they did that was to, as a hedge against Brexit. It's also felt in the industry that by being part of the European Union, we're able to cut much more attractive trade deals with the rest of the world. Um, the TTIP trade deal that's been negotiated between Europe and North America, there are elements of it that I am concerned about, but when you take away the issues of public services, the elimination of regulatory differences between Europe and the US could drive significant trade growth and benefit the UK car industry. Would we get as good a trade deal on our own? I doubt it. The fourth point is about accessing skilled workers. Estimates of how many EU-born citizens work in UK manufacturing vary between 1 in 8 workers and 1 in 10 workers, but it's significant. Uh, I was in a, a supply chain company factory in Birmingham not very long ago, and the signs in the factory are in English and in Polish, for obvious reasons. They can't get skilled workers in the UK, they have to bring them in. Now that's a reflection of our own shortcomings in our education and training system, but it's going to be a fundamental problem for the UK auto industry if we can't continue to hire skilled workers from Europe. A final point is that R&D funding, I've mentioned already that actually uh, not only UK universities but also car companies have got significant European funding, both through Horizon 2020 but also through the European Investment Bank, okay, which has invested billions in car companies in the UK for research and development. Ford has had several hundred million, Nissan has had several hundred million to develop electric drivetrains, lightweight materials. As I understand it, to be in the European Investment Bank, you've got to be an EU member. So quite how that is going to be untangled and whether we will continue to benefit from it is an interesting point. UK auto industry has been a star performer in recent years. So output peaked in the early 70s, it then declined as we opened up very quickly. Foreign companies attacked the UK very quickly and we lost our domestic base. Waves of Japanese investment. Uh, a long period of overvaluation of sterling from the Labour government through to uh, the sort of mid 2000s financial crisis and then a bounce back. So output in recent years has actually grown very quickly. Large amount of investment, eight billion pounds worth of investment in the last few years, several plants working flat out or very flexibly. The value of car exports has doubled over the last uh, 10 years or so. 80% of UK cars produced in the UK are exported. We've roughly got a trade balance in the UK in cars now. Go back to 2007, there was a £7.5 billion pound deficit. So you can see how competitiveness in the industry has changed in recent years. 57% of exports go to the EU. We often hear about how China is driving growth in the car industry. It is to an extent, but it's still not nearly as important as the European Union. Other indicators of success, about 2.5 million engines made in the UK. The plant utilisation rate is over 70%. That means you can get costs right down. In Italy, it's barely 50%. The industry has the highest levels of productivity in Europe. People don't realise that, even higher than Germany. And in a broad sense, with related industries, it employs about 800,000 people. Strong productivity growth. So productivity in the industry has trebled over the last 15 years. Unlike 
other parts of the UK economy where we've had a very poor rate of productivity growth. Why has that happened? Very high levels of investment in the industry, new plant and equipment, new ways of doing things. One of the issues is about the supply chain. There has been an effort to try and improve this in recent years, but only about 40% of the components going into a British-made car actually come from the UK. In the case of uh, BMW Mini, it's possibly even less than 20%. In the case of Vauxhall, it might have got to, say, 24%. The Japanese firms, it might be about a third. Jaguar Land Rover, probably over 50%. There's a big opportunity there to actually source more components locally and create jobs. So there's a kind of reshoring opportunity. We've been studying reshoring. Manufacturers bringing activity back to the UK. That's driven by exchange rate movements, rising costs in China, quality issues, the need for supply chain resilience, and also shorter lead time. So I was um, fortunate enough to visit a Bentley factory not very long ago and have a look around the plant. If you're lucky enough to be in a position to buy a Bentley, they start at about £250,000, but the sky's the limit. So somebody might come over from Abu Dhabi and say, I want the car the colour of my nail varnish. They paint a part of the car to see if she likes it. While there, they might choose the diamonds that go into it, they design the cocktail cabinet, and so on. It's a bespoke product that the consumer co-creates in a unique way with the manufacturer, and they're willing to pay a lot of money for that. Now, when you do that, you want a more localised supply chain that can respond very quickly to that demand. So you've seen a relocalization of suppliers as the market has shifted up market and you've got that consumer input into designing cars. However, we found big barriers to pushing that further. So it's barriers to reshoring, particularly in relation to skills, energy costs in the UK that are high, the availability of land, manufacturers often can't find anywhere to put a factory, and access to finance as you come down the supply chain. One of the things that the last government did was something called the Advanced Manufacturing Supply Chain Initiative. And I'll come back to that later, trying to rebuild the supply chain in the UK. Now, what underpins this recent success? Well, every time a car manufacturer launches a new model, they scout around plants looking for the best deal. It's pretty brutal. They play a, what's called a divide and game rule, and Rob and Phil have studied that sort of practice uh, in the real world. It's, it's brutal. Governments have to put in subsidies, workers have to work flexibly, they've got to get costs down and make it the UK an attractive place to invest. We've done very well at that in recent years, but being part of the single market has been part of the driver of attracting that investment. We've got a workforce that's very skilled and flexible. Unions are often part of the solution these days and not a problem. What's left of the industry is genuinely very productive and world class. The Sunderland plant at Nissan is seen as one of the most productive in the world. There's been a shift up market, which is continuing. You, know, you no longer see Nissan Micras made in Sunderland. That's gone to India. Nissan focus on high design content cars like the Qashqai, or Cash Cow as we call it. Um, electric vehicles like the one I drive, and the Infinity luxury brand. We saw an exchange rate depreciation during the financial crisis that's helped in terms of export growth. That was unwound, but the most recent depreciation may boost competitiveness again. We've got an emerging economies like China where you've got a big middle class, keen to show off their wealth. They drive premium cars, often made in the UK or Germany. And the government's industrial policy, starting with Mandelson, continuing through Vince Cable in the coalition into the beginning of this government, did help. Sajid Javid dismantled a lot of that, but there's scope to put some of it back in place, I would argue. So about 1.6 million cars made in the UK, 0.6 million exported to the EU, 0.6 million to the rest of the world. We buy about 2.6 million cars in the UK every year. About 2.2 million of those are imported from the EU. This is very much a single market with cars imported and exported. Manufacturers producing here are producing for the single market in Europe. So Brexit can impact in various ways. It can impact through economic growth. Slower growth means fewer cars being sold. That may impact on production. It may lead to investment delays because of the uncertainty. I'll say a little bit about that. Shifting cost bases, as the exchange rate, for example, has an impact. Possible export disruption if there are barriers to trade. We have seen policy intervention, of course, in terms of the Bank of England e easing monetary policy. That may have a benefit in terms of offsetting some of these uncertainties and making finance deals on cars easier to get. What we did see uh, earlier this year after the Brexit vote was a big drop in PMI, which is a measure of confidence which fell quite dramatically. It's bounced back again, some would say. And if you read a lot of the standard media, it's UK's coping very well post-Brexit. Well, firstly, 
it's too early to say because there's long lags in these sorts of things. Secondly, the drop in the PMI that we saw, which is a measure of confidence, was probably overstated. The bounce back has probably been overstated. When you take that into account, what that PMI measure that we've seen over the summer probably equates to is probably GDP growth of roughly zero in the final part of this year. So at best, we've avoided a recession so far, partly because the Bank of England have, have thrown the sink at things in terms of more quantitative easing and cutting interest rates. But zero economic growth is not a great position to be in, and it's going to impact on industries like manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So we are seeing slower economic growth. That means fewer car sales in the UK. General Motors and Ford have already actually cut production in Europe because the UK car market is growing slowly. That's also had an impact, we heard yesterday, on Ford cutting investment at its bridge end engine plant because they need fewer engines. The depreciation of sterling will make imported cars more expensive, so the cost of cars in the UK is likely to go up. The depreciation of sterling will probably make our exports more competitive, so in the short term we may see more cars being produced in the UK for export. But because we import so many components, the cost of production will go up, so that might squeeze margins. There is the possibility for more reshoring of the component supply chain, but that isn't going to happen automatically. We need an industrial policy to push that along. So in the short term, we're probably going to see lower UK car sales, but output up in the short term. However, that short term boost, I think, is massively outweighed by the uncertainty effect because we don't know what our trading relationship with Europe will be. Uncertainty is a big deterrent to foreign direct investment. Work done by my colleagues at Aston and at Warwick suggests that this uncertainty is going to be a major issue. The biggest thing that impacted, well, the two biggest things that impacted on foreign direct investment in the UK in the last 30 or 40 years were firstly the creation of the single market that boosted investment here because firms could then build supply chains across the UK and Europe and move things around. The biggest negative impact came from our exit from the exchange rate mechanism back in the early 90s, which led to a big drop in foreign direct investment in the UK. Now, the exit from the exchange rate mechanism didn't say anything about the underlying state of the UK economy, but it meant a lot of uncertainty for investors, so they postponed investment in the UK. Our exit from Europe may have a very similar effect. So particularly when car companies are competing for the next round of investment, is a big multinational car company going to invest in the UK when they don't know what the trading relationship will be with Europe? I doubt it very much. Uh, this is um, Tim Lawrence, who's the head of manufacturing at PA Consulting. He actually goes as far as saying it places a question mark over the future of a number of the UK car plants and jobs. There's a number of challenges here. Firstly is that we are about to enter a period of negotiation. At some point, Article 50 will be activated. There's a two-year period, unless it's extended, during which negotiations take place. Car makers may decide to postpone investment in the UK. That's important because at any point in time, cars produced in the UK will, will start to be phased out, refreshed models will be introduced, and new models will be introduced. So if you postpone things, automatically you're not getting the investment in new models. So that's going to impact on pl plant productivity and the number of cars that are made here. If at the end of the process, car manufacturers think that our access to the single market is inadequate, they may close and move elsewhere. So my point about uh, total output in the UK, about 1.6 million, forecasts to rise to about 1.8 million. The blue bars are current models. The green bars are midlife refresh models, and the red ones are new models that are introduced. Now, current models will be phased out. That's always happening. Midlife refreshments come in, and then you've got completely new models coming in. You add those bars together, you get to your 1.8 million. If you've got a two- or three-year window where we don't know what's happening, I can't see car manufacturers investing in refreshes or new models. That's the uncertainty effect. It's a chilling effect on the industry. Uh, this is a table from PA Consulting, difficult to see, so I apologise, but basically it goes to all the different manufacturers, Honda, General Motors, BMW Mini, Toyota, Nissan, Tata, Jaguar, Land Rover, looking at all the models produced in the UK. The models in red up to 2019, it's probably already been decided that they will be produced here. So we know that Honda is already investing 
to produce the Honda Civic at Swindon from 2017. That's been decided. Uh, BMW will be making the Countryman, a version of the Mini, uh, at its plant at Oxford in 2018, Toyota, the next generation, Aris, Aventis, at Burnison in 2018, and so on. The models in blue probably haven't been decided. So from 2020, we don't know yet whether Nissan will make the next generation Qashqai at Sunderland. They haven't made that decision. They will basically launch a new model every, say, six years. They'll make the decision on it probably three years ahead. So that decision on the Qashqai is probably going to be made around here, right in the middle of Article 50 negotiation. Is Nissan going to invest hundreds of millions in building the next Qashqai in Sunderland if it doesn't know what the trading relationship will be? I doubt it. So the issue is about this uncertainty and the fact we know there is a cycle to these investments taking place over time. Um, PA suggests there's a number of different groups <coughs> in the industry. So potential levers, they highlight Honda and Toyota as those most at risk of closure. They're very reliant on exports to Europe. They've got relatively low margins and profitability, operating below capacity, and there are decisions on new models coming. So those are the ones they see as most vulnerable to closure. The question marks they put over BMW Mini, Nissan, Vauxhall, where there's a British heritage element, but there are European options. I'm skeptical on that. I think Vauxhall actually is one of the most vulnerable. They import many components. They've got loads of spare capacity in Europe. And while Vauxhall is a brand that sells very well in the UK, are British consumers actually that bothered whether a product is made here or in Europe? I doubt it. So I'd actually say that is one of the most vulnerable to closing. Stayers are seen more in the premium end, so JLR, Jaguar Land Rover, Bentley, Aston Martin. Those are dependent on European and overseas markets, but British brand is important. It's interesting, for example, that in China, Jaguar Land Rover, the cars that it makes in China has to sell at a 15, 20% discount in China because Chinese customers will be willing to pay more for a British-made product. So making something in the UK is still worth things around the world. Um, we know, for example, General Motors' chief financial officer is talking about a possible £400 million headwind from Brexit already in the uh, second half of this year. What he's referring there to, for example, is depreciation, meaning imported components more expensive, so costs in the UK have gone up. Ford has talked about a half a billion dollar impact of Brexit over the next two years. Um, if we think about how the car industry is changing, uh, I drive an electric car. It's a connected car, so it's always connected to the internet. Um, there are, I used to be able to control the car from my iPhone through an app, but um, Nissan realized it could be hacked, so they turned it off, sadly. But <coughs> that's the direction we're going in. Um, and I've just been in Singapore enjoying a drive in a driverless car. They're coming. Um, they've already been tested in the UK, and we're likely to see them on our roads by the mid-20s, mid-2020s. Uh, shorter development cycles coming. Huge huge cost pressure because these new technologies are very expensive. Companies are having to cooperate over the underlying platforms that go into cars. We're seeing changes in patterns of mobility as well in some big cities, not so much in places like Birmingham where I live, but in London, in Paris, in other mega cities, there's the emergence more of car sharing, companies like Zipcar, whereby you pay to access a car. And ultimately, if you think about autonomous cars coming, which they will, you won't ultimately need to own a car. You'll be able to hire a car on your smartphone in an urban area. It'll pick you up, take you somewhere. It'll mean far fewer cars on the roads, less pollution, fewer accidents, hopefully. So big changes taking place in the industry. And many car companies no longer sell you cars. They get you to buy a mobility package. So I pay X amount per month to use my electric car. That may or may not include an energy deal. If I want to go further afield because it has a limited range, I can use a hybrid or something else to go and see my mum in Stoke if I want to. So I'm actually buying a mobility package. That will become more likely. So we're seeing huge changes taking place in the industry at various speeds. Now, Brexit has got the potential to impact on loads of those in the UK. Are we going to see investment in driverless cars in the UK? Uh, that's an issue in particular in terms of autonomous cars because we need to have common regulations with Europe on things like data sharing, uh, wavelength, um, all, uh, regulations, all sorts of things. So regulations aren't going away in the industry. In fact, they're going to get even more important as driverless cars come. Um, cost pressures have already gone up in the UK, given depreciation in sterling. 
Are companies going to cooperate between UK companies and European firms? Uh, are we going to get investment in the shift towards electric vehicles in the UK? So Brexit can have a, a fundamentally important impact on investment in the car industry and how competitiveness is shaped. Think about how the supply chain to produce an electric car is fundamentally different to that for a standard internal combustion engine car. Again, you can't see this very well, but we're seeing shift towards things like autonomous vehicles, uh, charging networks, um, 3D printing has already started in the car industry. There's one car company in America called Local Motors where you design the car and they print it out for you. So we're, we're shifting into that era of more personalization as well. Are we going to see investment in the UK if in Britain there's significant trading barriers with Europe or regulatory differences? I've got some doubts about that. So some immediate priorities to consider is we need rapid progress on a trade deal with the EU and also we need from the government an indication of where its priorities lie. What we saw offer from Brexiters is not achievable in total. So is the emphasis going to be on access to the single market or is it going to be on, on restricting immigration and then what does that mean for access to the single market? This is fundamentally important for the car industry. Um, being able to hire skilled workers from the EU is hugely important as well. We also are going to need an industrial policy for automotive and manufacturing. And I've put the final point there in the sense that who's actually got a seat at the table? We know that the City of London is going to be able to shape things. Well, is manufacturing going to have a say in this or not? Um, in terms of industrial policy, just to finish off, this is my last slide, you'll be glad to know. Um, we do actually need to go back to looking at what industrial policy means and we need an industrial policy to support our manufacturing base. So we've got to try to eliminate that uncertainty over trade as soon as possible. My own preference is for a Norway-style solution if we want to maintain investment in the car industry. If there's this uncertainty over investment in the UK, then instead of giving generalised corporation tax cuts, which the government has talked about, we need to do look at something specific that means we will attract inward investment. For example, boosting capital allowances would enable investors to recover the cost of that investment more quickly. Obama has done this very successfully in America as part of his effort to get reshoring of manufacturing in the US. We need to kind of reboot our industrial policy and funding. Now, the previous business secretary, Sajid Javid, dismantled a lot of the industrial policy that had been created by Vince Cable and before him, Mandelson. So the Manufacturing Advisory Service, scrapped. The Advanced Manufacturing Supply Chain Initiative, scrapped. The tooling up loan fund, scrapped. I could go on. Um, not a lot was put in place of it. Now, we've got a new business secretary who has a history of devolving things. There is an opportunity here to revisit some of this. So, for example, manufacturing advisory service scrapped. The argument was we've now got these local growth hubs in LEPs, in local enterprise partnerships, that can pick that up. Well, they couldn't. They were underfunded. They weren't ready and in many cases didn't have a manufacturing interest. So if we're really going to do that, let's fund it properly and make them work. Skills, hugely important, a big barrier to reshoring. Let's devolve it properly to the regions. In fact, why, does, why do we even have a skills quango in London at all that's responsible for this? This is something that could be devolved to the regional level as part of city deals or as part of combined authorities much more effectively. If we're going to really crack this skills issue, I'd argue that we need to give a big incentive to the big manufacturers to overtrain. So whether it's Jaguar Land Rover or Airbus or JCB or Rolls-Royce, we need to be giving them tax breaks or incentives to say, right, train two or three times the number of apprentices that you, you need, the ones you don't need, let them go into the supply chain. Uh, that will, that's something that Germany does. It's something we used to do 40 years ago. We could better support our exporters through export credit guarantees. If we're going to try and target foreign investment, let's think about what level of the supply chain and what the technology is that they're bringing to help develop those new technologies we need. How can we better support innovation, whether through R&D tax credits or through the catapult centers that were set up? Now, they were a great idea, but there was a, a pressure on them to become freestanding and self-funding, I think, far too quickly. One of the issues there, of course, is that a lot of their funding comes from Horizon 2020, so we don't know whether that's going to keep coming in. And a final point is on energy costs. We've levied very substantial extra taxes on manufacturers in the UK and have increased the price of electricity here. That is probably the right thing to be doing 
to meet our climate obligations. The point is, other countries aren't doing it. So energy prices in the UK are two or three times those in Europe, possibly four times those in the United States. Now, if we're going to put an extra burden on manufacturing, which we've done, we have to compensate them in some other way, by reducing national insurance costs, giving them better research and development subsidies, or something. So we have not compensated manufacturing for the extra costs that we've put onto them. I think that's something we really need to consider. So I'd like to finish there and maybe allow Phil to respond. Okay. I've probably gone on too long, Phil, but... No, that's fantastic. Thank, thank you. Come thank back. you, thank you very much. <laughs> I didn't keep that on, actually. Okay. So. Sorry, uh, my favourite <laughs> cover the day after. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, David, for that very illuminating talk. And um, if you want to take a seat, actually, yeah, you might take a glass of water or something. Thank you. Um, uh, it's very sobering times and very challenging times, I, I think. Um, I've just got a few points, really, and I'd like to widen up the discussion as well to sort of industrial, industrial policy and um, the challenge for the UK um, more widely. And then... Um, I'm going to raise these and um, invite you to come back as, as well, sure. David, and comment, and invite the audience as well to comment as well. Um, you're very right, and, and it's critical we get a we get a trade deal in place that is um, going to be good for business <coughs> and, and good for the UK economy. Um, it had been muted um, by Boris Johnson, actually, and, and others, that maybe we could get a get some sort of halfway house membership. This is the early part of the Brexit campaign before Boris Johnson showed his cards. But he said, you know, maybe we could uh, negotiate a halfway house membership where the UK could cherry pick <coughs> what he likes about EU membership, what he likes about the single market, and even have a seat on the table in determining regulations. But um, I think that's really not going to happen. It's, it's really overly optimistic. I mean, work for, by the Centre of European Reform looked at this and said, this is just not going to happen. It's just wishful thinking. Um, there's nothing in the EU treaties to allow this to happen, and it would involve, you know, having a bespoke agreement for the for the UK, which would, which would really give us favoured spa status and create all sort of disharmony across the EU uh, and, and and with other countries which have bilateral agreements with the EU. So we really do need to get a, a trade deal. I think the wishful thinking of people like Boris Johnson was is not is not going to happen in that regard. Um, just, I don't know if you're aware of the LSE work on, um, on foreign direct investments. Um, they did a report earlier in the year, and they specifically looked at the, at the, uh, at the automotive industry and, um, and the importance of a trade <coughs> deal. And their estimates, and, uh, and they're suggesting the worst-case scenario, if we had a hard Brexit deal in terms of a trade, that could lead to production of cars falling in the UK by about 180,000 per annum. So, you know, about 12% fall in, in production in the UK and lead to price rises by about 3%. A softer Brexit, single market access and, and possibly free, free movement of labour, still a fall but about, about 36,000 cars, but it's, you know, it, it's, it's quite serious. It's, kind of, it's quite a serious issue for the, um, for the car industry. I think really... Looking at the, th at the whole picture, I think if we're lucky, we might end up in a position where we're just slightly worse off than before the 25th of June in terms of trade. In terms of industrial strategy policy, um, I think one of the claims is that um, if you're out of the EU, then you're no longer bound by EU rules and regulations, and particularly on EU competition and state aid rules, which forbids providing particular assistance to particular firms and, uh, and, and, and sectors. So that was one of the arguments, but that's, again, um, unlikely because any sort of deal on trade is going to be linked to regulations. And e you know, European Economic um, Association members, such as Norway, um, have to abide by state, EU state aid rules. Um, so that's an issue for industrial strategy. It's quite interesting, this new department for business, energy, and industrial strategy is in place. You've got a new Secretary of State, as David mentioned, but it has no responsibility for trade policy or even higher education policy. They've been hived off to, uh, to other departments. I mean, Liam Fox has got his own department now. Trade policy 
and higher education as well, they're key elements of an industrial strategy. You know, you need to have some joined up thinking. So this is going to be a real challenge for government. And I can imagine the debates around, around the cabinet between um, the Fox's department on one hand, I mean, he's already trying to, to get the best uh, civil servants to work in his department and, uh, and this <coughs> new business department as, as well. So there's going to be quite a, quite a lot of uh, debates going on there. Um, and uh, you know, that it's very important we have a coordinated strategy on that. I think a more generic problem as well is that um, you know, outside automotive, uh, the UK has a very poor record, in record on investment, has low productivity, and a record trade deficit. That's unsustainable, and that's a real problem with the UK economy. It's a, it's a trade deficit. We've been <coughs> going on about deficits over the last few years, been worried about the fiscal deficit. The real problem is the trade deficit, because if you can't sort that out, you're not going to be, be, able to, be able to trade in the world, you're not going to be able to pay your way in the world. Um, and these things are linked to linked. You know, the linked, you know, low productivity is linked to low investment. And that's, you know, if you get the investment right, get the right investment in capital equipment, you can improve labour productivity. Give people better equipment to work with, you can improve that productivity. That makes you more competitive and that can feed in to your ability to trade competitively in the world. And I think in this regard, I mean, there's, uh, there's a number of ways you can, you, you've got to try and get business to invest more. I think the uncertainty behind Brexit is, is very concerning. Um, but there's going to have to be an increased role for the, for the public to take a role in, in investing in infrastructure projects. Um, because this can crowd in new private sector investment. Quite a lot of work on this by Nick Crafts and, and Mariana Masakatu, who was here, here last year, talking about this, the role of the state you know, can bring in, you know, with it through infrastructure projects and, and other range of projects, can crowd in private sector <coughs> investment. And that's going to be very important as well. Um, a regional strategy, again linked to, linked to uh, the requirement for an industrial strategy. Um, I find it quite ironic, actually, when, when looking at the Brexit vote. Uh, um, and this is some work that a colleague of ours, Professor Phil McCann uh, from the Netherlands, um, has done some analysis on this, that the regions which were most pro-Brexit in the UK uh, overwhelmingly voted for Brexit. Often the, they were most mar seemed to be the most marginalised, they seemed to be the poorer regions. But they seem to have the most to lose from exiting the EU. In terms of not only will lose their access to structural funds, I mean, think of Wales, South Wales, I think it's uh, a good example had billions in structural funds, EU structural funds, for redevelopment and, and regional growth. And um, they're going to lose that. But also, in, if we get a hard Brexit deal, we revert to World Trade Organization rules, um, those regions are going to be most exposed to low-cost competition and globalization. I think Patrick Minford, as, as David mentioned earlier, one of the few economist in favour of Brexit actually actually made this admission. Um, you know, with, with Brexit, go to the WTO, world rules, manufacturing, UK manufacturing will go to zero. And he was quite happy about that, quite relaxed about that. He was quite happy about it in the 1980s when he was advising on, on monetary policy. He's quite happy about it now. I think that's a real issue because it's going to be a real issue for our regions. We've, got, we've already got regional imbalance in the UK. That's creating tensions and, and creating all sorts of problems. So that's a real issue. Um, I think um, in terms of regional strategies, um, I know David's done a lot of work on this, and we can, we, we can come back to you and, and quiz you a little bit more on this, but um, I think there's going to have to be an increased emphasis on ex nurturing and exploiting specific regional capabilities. Um, and in particular favouring what we call place-based strategies. It's kind of interesting, the EU uh, in the last few years has started to move towards a non-neutral policy stance in the sense that it said we've got to be smart in our state aid, we've got to be smart in, in supporting particular um, activities. And, and, and they've emphasised or advocated what, we call, what was known as a smart specialisation strategy. Now what a smart specialisation strategy is, it's not investing in in particular sectors per se, 
but it's actually supporting particular activities or technological domains with potential for, you know, um, the potential for, for commercial gain. So a good example would be, I've done a lot of work on the ceramics industry in, in, in Staffordshire, a good example of a smart specialisation strategy would not be supporting the ceramics industry in North Staffordshire per se, but it will be supporting you know, research into more efficient energy use in the firing of kilns, which is a big issue for the, for the ceramics manufacturers. More locally, and I notice Steve's here and, and, and John Hunter here, um, another sports specialisation strategy which is really close to home will be investing in the new, in a new IAP centre uh, uh, you know, for more fuel-efficient propulsion centres in automotive and the aerospace industries. So those sort of factors, we're going we're to hopefully see a lot more of that because that's, you know, we need to, we need to up the game really to get the higher value added activities and focus on regional, cap uh, regional capabilities. And, and finally, I think, uh, linked to this, we need to be get better at commercialising science and building even closer links between higher education and industry. Um, I think the catapults are a, go are a good um, a way forward uh, in this regard. Um, but as the review of catapults last year mentioned for the government, they need long-term consistent funding. Um, and there should be more interaction with small firms, small and medium-sized firms, if we're going to if we're going to deliver what, what we'd like them to deliver. So, um, you know, there are significant challenges, I think, um, for the UK, significant challenges for industrial policy. Um, I don't know if you've got any, any further thoughts on that, David, about, from this... Uh, yeah, they're, they're about. very useful comments, Phil. I mean, I think just um, picking up one of the points about how uh, those regions which are most dependent on EU funding were most... Eurosceptic, those were of course also the regions that have lost out most from globalization. So those are the ones that have lost out in terms of say imports coming from China replacing domestic industries. So that seems to suggest that the vote really wasn't about the European Union, but it was people who had lost out from globalization protesting. Um, now, quite what they voted for of course, we. We, we don't know. So that does raise the question of whether down the line, when whatever deal has been done, do we need to put it to the people again to say, are you happy with this deal or would you rather stay in now? The chances of that happening are rather remote, but I think this was largely a protest about globalization and the loss of our industrial base. And we probably haven't done enough ourselves to compensate the losers of globalization in terms of retraining, reskilling, building the new industries. You know, I've just come back from, from Singapore where there's a massive program of what's called skills future. They realize the economy is, is changing, certain industries and jobs will disappear, and there's a kind of commitment to retrain people throughout their lives, not just when you're at school and university, but throughout their lives to reskill into the new jobs that are available. And that's something we fundamentally failed at in the UK, I think, and we've got to get our head around. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Back to Amy, to the audience. So have we got any microphones at all? Do we have any? Yeah, sure. Okay. So I'm only up to um, audience participation. If you've got any questions for, for David or myself, then please... Uh, we'll, we'll rove around. We'll run around, but you need to speak into the mic before you answer the question. Uh, my name's Matt Griffith. I have um, Directional Policy at Business West. It's just the Chamber of Commerce for Bristol Bath, but also Swindon, which has a high automobile sector in it. Um, really interesting talk, David. Thank you. Um, a couple of specific things around impact. Um, looking at uh, the degree of local content between 30 to 40 percent and the possible deals on the table would suggest to me that A, we're going to have to have some form of rules of origin certification because Norway has and everyone else does who has a third party relationship with EU <coughs> and that, that could be a quite a, mecha a protectionist mechanism by the EU to retain higher value um, in the EU and, and, and disadvantage for UK. So rules of origin are critical. I wondered what your thoughts on that would, are and whether there are other third parties we can compare to in terms of their rules of origin they have with the EU on, on auto, whether Norway or Switzerland. And, and a second question around politics, really. One of the notable things in the referendum was that 
some of the um, international investors were keeping their heads down. There was high political risk. It was obviously a very politically contested time in the UK, and the, the benefits of speaking out for those companies was rather limited. Um, so Honda didn't say anything of note during the referendum campaign. What's your view of how influential uh, the auto lobby is into Whitehall and Westminster, and how much traction they will have to David Davis, to Liam Fox, and others who aren't necessarily thinking through the downsides fully at this point, and how effective will they be at mobilising? Thank you. If I could start with the last one first. Um, I don't know how effective they are. I mean, the, the Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders is very active, um, so they will be representing the industry. I think Unite has got a big role to play as a trade union as well. Um, I mean, car companies, some of them did say things during the referendum campaign, so Jaguar Land Rover, um, Nissan, Toyota were quite clear that they wanted to stay in. Um, I think they, were, they wrote to their workforces to say, look, we're better off staying in, and these are the reasons why, it's up to you how you vote, but at least think about it. Um, I think the opposite is now the case, so some of them were quite vocal before because they wanted to influence the outcome. Now it's happened, I think we may well see things taking place and, and the company saying, well, actually, this is not to do with Brexit. So yesterday, we saw Ford announce, for example, that it was halving its investment at Bridge End. It was planning to invest £200 million and produce 250,000 cars a year, uh, engines a year at Bridge End. It's halved that in investment. Now it's said it's nothing to do with Brexit. I don't believe that. I think it is partly to do with Brexit, partly because demand for cars in the UK has gone down, Ford has cut output, and partly because of this uncertainty effect, why invest huge amounts in the UK when you don't know if in a couple of years' time you're going to get tariffs on those exports of engines to then assemble cars in Europe to then import the cars back to the UK? So I think they've basically postponed the decision. But companies aren't going to say that because there's no political capital uh, in them I in saying it. On your first point about local content, yes, you're absolutely right. Rules of origin, I think, will be important if some sort of trade deal like that with Norway or Switzerland is done. The irony, of course, though, is that Norway doesn't really have a manufacturing sector to talk about. It has a very big oil industry, it's got tourism, it's got forestry, it's got various other things, but not a big manufacturing industry. Switzerland does, so that might be a more interesting case to look at in terms of rules of origin. And, of course, we've got Canada coming as well with a Canadian-European uh, trade deal. Now, some of the Brexiters point to that as somewhere we may go, but it's interesting that the Canadian ambassador to the UK has said, well, actually, this gives us far less access to the single market than you've got already. And by the way, it took us nine years. Um, David, yeah, can I uh, join Matt in, in um, thanking you for excellent talks, really, really informative. Um, I've got a couple of questions to, to follow up on what you've just said. The, the first is what one of the sort of discourses of globalisation you know, in its sort of heyday was that companies were becoming denationalized, that they had no longer any loyalties to particular nation states. Um, and I wonder whether in the automotive sector, uh, where the real political and policy decisions will be taken, will they be taken in the host country, so BMW in Germany, Munich, you know, Japanese countries, companies very deeply embedded with the Japanese state, and whether in effect, you know, when those uh, companies are lobbying the UK government, the real decisions will be taken in Germany and Japan and the US rather than uh, in the UK. Um, and then just related to that, one of the sort of, you know, when you listen to U Eurosceptics talking about, <coughs> certainly in recent months during the debate and then actually also since the result, you, you, you have this sort of way of thinking about um, our relationship with <coughs> Europe and the rest of the world, which appears to be that, you know, we make things here and then we sell them to other countries. And, you know, you either pay a tariff on that or you don't. And that's the sort of model of how they think about our future trading relationships. And I wonder if you say a little bit more about the automotive sector in the single market, insofar as um, people and goods, parts and finished products move around distributed operations within the single market, such that, you know, as the Japanese government's um, paper before the G20 pointed out, there are all sorts of levels upon which they need reassurances about people movement, about um, uh, rules of origin, about operations and so on, and just how, how people can be made more aware in these debates about um, what the single market really means for um, companies with distributed operations and therefore how we can't think about immigration policy as just about people coming here or trade policy about us selling over there. Yeah, thank you. Two very good questions. Um, 
On the first one, it's a very top-down industry. So that decision yesterday, uh, uh, the reduction in investment in Bridge End, that decision will have been made in Detroit. Uh, investments about Japanese investment in the UK will be made in Japan. So it's a very classic uh, top-down industry with the big strategic decisions made at headquarters. You have got regional level operations with a degree of decision-making autonomy in Europe, but ultimately it's made back at head office. So these decisions will be made around the world. And the reason why that document was put out by the Japanese government, very unusually so, was because Japanese car manufacturers back in Tokyo and, and uh, Toyota City were saying to the government, look, we've got an issue. Um, that gets us on to your second point. Basically, we've got value chains crossing borders. So we don't have trade as in a kind of classic trade model of the 19th century. We've got multinationals controlling value chains that cross countries. So if we say you look at the mini that's made in Oxford, the engines that go into that are produced at Hams Hall at Birmingham, incredibly flexible, efficient plant. They have big investment there in recent years. The components that, that come into that engine, some will come to the UK, but a lot will come from Germany or from a joint venture with Peugeot in France. The components that come into that will may come from Italy. So you've got a supply chain which then goes into particular modules of a car. It could be the engine, it could be the cockpit, it could be the front end, which are then put together by the assembler. And of course, in that case, the assembly operation is in Oxford. The headquarters is BMW back in Munich. And by the way, recently they opened a new plant in the Netherlands that makes minis as well. Partly, I think, because they were concerned about Brexit and they want to be able to play the two plants off against each other. So you've got a value chain that crosses borders. And as much as 50% of world trade is actually within companies. So it's not country A trading with company B, country B. It's a multinational firm controlling the value chain crossing borders. Anything that gets in the way of their ability to manage that value chain across borders will damage trade. And that's why the single market has such a pronounced impact on trade and investment and benefits for the UK in that it became easier for companies to coordinate that value chain from one place across different countries. If that becomes more difficult, we will lose investment in the UK. Hi, I'm Lucy Crisp. I'm a corporate partnerships manager here at Bath. Um, we've, you mentioned about kind of higher education and business um, and Ford kind of cutting their investment into production. Um, so, for example, and also you mentioned IAPS here at Bath, we've got world leading researchers into lowering emissions in cars. How much do you think it's a risk of within Brexit that the R&D departments of companies like Ford, like BMW, will stop choosing to invest in the world-class researchers here because of Brexit? I mean, if somewhere it has got expertise, and uh, and that you know you can you can build an expertise, and you get a, what we call knowledge spillovers in the, in that particular area. Um, now, government can't create that, but it can kind of facilitate that through support. Um, that makes a place sticky, what we call sticky, so an attractive you know to companies to you know, to be involved in that in that project. So I think to some extent, and this comes back to the point on making on regional strategy, you know, the, it's kind of interesting that the government is now using this term industrial strategy. I mean, it used to be a dirty word you know, in, in government for the last 30 odd years or so. Um, it's now using this, t this term, and it, it really depends on government support for, for projects which are, um, which are potentially technological le technologically leading. Okay, now, it, you know, um, it's not about picking winners, as I say. It's not about, you know, it's about experimentation. You need to have close relationships between industry and the university sector and researchers. There's some things are going to fail. And it's, it, uh, um, industrial strategy, as, as Danny Rodrick, one of the leading writers in this field, said it's a process of discovery. And we're going to have to learn, learn and perhaps learn qu quickly. But I think really government has to, will, will take, have to take a bigger lead than it has done in the past if we are to be able to, you know, um, keep 
high level, high tech research and development in the UK and attract firms as well. Do you want to add to that, yeah. please? I'd agree with that. I'm a bit more positive about that than the, the sort of assembly side of things. And we have seen, well, if you look at the UK car industry, actually, most of them don't do research and development in the UK, let's be honest. They simply assemble here. Um, Jaguar Land Rover accounts between 50 and 80% of R&D spend in the UK car industry. And there's this kind of golden sort of banana, as it were, that goes through the East Mid Western East Midlands. So it goes from the Motor Industry Research Association through Coventry, Coventry University, Warwick um, Manufacturing Group, Jaguar Land Rover, uh, down through various consultancy firms into the Motorsport Valley. And that's where the research and development takes place. And it's incredibly active. And um, while we've seen the loss of the mass industry in the Midlands in recent years, we've seen the emergence of what I call the Phoenix industry. It's arisen from the ashes of the old industry. And it's a lot of small firms doing research and development, often collaboratively with government support, in some cases European funding, to develop the technologies that the big players then pick up. Some of them have come out of motorsport, others have come out of aerospace, and they develop uh, technologies that can be used in different sectors. It could be lightweight materials, could be electric drive trains. So we've got this fantastic small research base, which many of the big players then link into. And partly that also reflects a change that's taken place in the industry. It's a bit like pharmaceutical and a shift towards open innovation. So given the challenges they face, they can't do everything in-house anymore. So they've got challenges over the environment, health and safety, developing driverless cars. They have to look outside to ideas. So a lot of these companies and universities are very well placed to help answer those challenges. But we've got to get the right policy framework in place to make sure they're in a position to do it. Yeah, very, very interesting um, presentation, and, th and it really brought together all the issues very well. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, I, I was taken by the number of issues that you both raised that were nothing to do with the EU. Um, low investment over a number of years. We'll be a member of the EU for 50 years, and low investment is not a problem for the EU. The trade deficit and fiscal deficit that we currently have, we had those whilst we're members of the EU. The lack of skills, well, that's not an EU issue. Um, industrial strategy, and actually the one area we got good industrial strategy on automotive is actually the, the, the kind of reverse example. But low productivity, pretty well everywhere else, perhaps apart from automotive and aerospace. Uh, and the problems with the supply chain. These are all issues we have now and cannot be laid at the floor of the EU, and, w and there was a combination of kind of EU problems for the future and problems that seem to be systemic in our economy right now. So the questions are, you know, whether we're in the EU or out the EU, what do we do about all those other things that you've mentioned in your, in your presentations today? Sure, that's, that's a very good point. Um, a lot, and that, uh, I did allude to that, a lot of our problems are homegrown the lack of investment in skills, the lack of investment full stop, the inability of the supply chain to access finance from banks, particularly in automotive, by the way, where there are particular issues. Um, but I would argue that some of those are going to be more intense now because of Brexit. So in the case of skills, we've not done enough to grow our own. We've therefore looked outside to bring people in. If that now becomes more difficult, we've got an even more pressing skills problem. So not only are we going to have to hire the best people from the EU and make sure we can continue to do that and the rest of the world, we've got to put even more emphasis on growing our own skills for the type of economy we need in the future. So you're absolutely right. These are homegrown problems. I think part of the referendum, people were voting in a way to sort of say, well, let's, let's give policymakers a good kicking. This is one thing we can vote on. It happens to be the EU, but we want to complain about the state of our lives. I think that we're going to have to start addressing some of these fundamental problems, and Brexit, in many ways, will bring them into sharper focus. But you're right, there, it's a co there's a combination here. I, I think you know, Dennis is interesting to add to that about homegrown, homegrown deficits. We only had this deindustrialization in the 1980s and 1990s. There was no, you know, we saw the, the decline of the old, old industries. There was nothing really put in place to replace them, you know, no sort of strategy. Um, they sort of left to wither on the, on the vine. And I think that was a real tragedy, really. And that led, has led to a lot of these regions being marginalized and, 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 and felt, the, you know, felt that they've, they're not part of the, uh, you know, of the growth that we've been 
we, 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 we've had. Um, and I think there's, that's, that's been a really, uh, a really wasted opportunity. And I think if we'd had a, a proper regional strategy, we, we might be on a, on a better footing. Um, I, I, a lot of evidence to suggest is that, you know, if you can try and um, build on upon existing regional capabilities in particular fields and marry them with new technologies, new te ideas, that can fuse, can fuse regional growth. And I think that's something we need to be looking at. Um, my little bit of, of worry about the smart specialization um, framework is it might just favor regions which have stronger capabilities uh, at present, and, and that means, uh, <coughs> you know, uh, marginalized regions are going to be left, left even further behind. So we need to really think about that, rethink how we can revitalize our regional economies, and that would attract investment, which would hopefully improve productivity, which would hopefully improve the trade deficit. So I think we, we need to really think back on, on, on a regional strategy um, and have a proper, uh, you know, proper debate about that, where we want to go with that. I mean, I think one thing that did happen is that government hid behind the EU, as it were. So successive governments who really didn't want an industrial policy and didn't want to support manufacturing said, well, we can't do this because of state aid rules. Complete and utter crap, by the way, because governments all over Europe were doing all sorts of interventions, part nationalisation, part-time wage subsidies, industrial policy. We just said, no, we, actually, we had fundamentally anti-interventionist governments pretending that they couldn't do it because of the EU. That wasn't the case. When we do leave, there's no excuse. So if we are going to build advanced manufacturing, new technologies of the future. We need an industrial policy to support it, and there's no excuse for not doing it. Can I pick up on this? Because I think it's kind of important, and I'm trying to see um, a bit of light at the end of the tunnel, because one of the interesting things about successful industrial policies is they take a very long time, and that's part of the Danny Roderick stuff about learning. Um, so talking to state bankers in Brazil, yeah. reckon it took them 10 years to make decent decisions about the kinds of investments. Well, you can work that in Germany, and they do, but you really need some kind of political consensus. And it may be that one way through that is actually to do it at the regions rather than at central government, because you may get regions creating a consensus in a way that you don't get at that other level, at that Westminster level. But the other problem, and it comes back to Singapore, is that they are brilliant at intelligence, and we are dreadful at intelligence. Um, and that means that you've got to really upskill the capacities of the state to understand where there are opportunities, where investment, state investment, could be best placed. So we're talking about project which is going to take 10 years to really come about but it needs to start and it needs to be serious and it needs you know at some level a degree of consensus to can i just add, ask you come back, come back to you, um, you you mentioned the regional level and it's quite interesting that we've now got a sort of a devolution agenda going on do you see that could you see that as a way in which you can build this political consensus at a, at a region, regional level? Yeah, I... I you well, see any, any I, hope in that? I've got an aspiration about that, <laughs> I guess. Um, I'm not sure how much further I could take that. But when you look, for example, at Germany, you, what you see is industrial policies at different kinds of levels. Um, but the one that I'm most interested in uh, actually comes out of their Department of Education. Um, and this is the cluster concept, whereby they have an open competition whereby higher education institutions, the dual system, their top companies but not their multinationals, uh, and SMEs form a cluster and then compete for very large sums of federal money. But those clusters can be within regions. So there is the possibility of trying to put the two things together. And I think that's actually what's required. It's not just leave it to the regions and here's some money. It's putting all that kind of package together. That's a very good point. I think um, what, what we really need is a, you know, an industrial policy that at a national level targets the technologies and competences that we need for the sectors that are going to develop in the future, 
and a place-based approach at a regional level. The two have got to join up. Now, to be fair to Greg Clark, I think he gets that because he, he's, he's you know, cognizant of the fact that we need industrial policy. He has a, a strong devolving instinct. He's probably the one person in government who might be up for this conversation. How far we get with it, um, I don't actually know. But I think you're right that the regional dimension is, is important. It was interesting that when the last government abolished the regional development agencies, there was a pretty unanimous view, for example, in the West Midlands, that actually Advantage West Midlands, the RDA, had been doing a good job. Businesses were overwhelmingly in favour of keeping it, and they were broadly agreed about what the objectives are, were and where we were going. That was all chucked out. So it's about having a long-term perspective, about it being sectoral, technological, but also place-based. I think you're absolutely right. I'm a bit surprised, actually, one one factor, uh, hearing the word industrial policy so many times now. So I was wondering what, what do you see, um, you know, in this age of uh, especially global <coughs> supply chains, uh, we talked about multinationals taking decisions which are maybe influencing the state themselves at a regional and local level. So what role do you see, uh, you know, your, uh, of the industrial policy, uh, let's say subsidies or, or other uh, in future industrial development in, in, in the UK? Okay, I think my last slide partly answered that in terms of the types of policies we need you to see, but it also echoes Phil's point about what modern industrial policy is, and that's a process of discovery of tacit knowledge between the government and the private sector. Um, and that's in various ways how modern industrial policy is done around the world. It's not allowed about government picking winners anymore because often you end up with, you know, companies that fail, British Leylands of this world. Um, but it's about government working with industry, business, to discover tacit knowledge. And it's a process. So it's not about saying up front, uh, we want to develop this industry and these are the tools we're going to use. It's about saying for a particular sector or technology, right, what are the challenges? What are the opportunities? How do we overcome those challenges? And therefore, together, can we find ways of doing it? So it's a process of discovery of tacit knowledge. Now, in the UK's case, that's actually worked quite well in aerospace and automotive. There was, there's bodies like the Automotive Council that bring different actors together. They've done that process. There's the Aerospace Partnership that's done something similar. Hasn't been applied as well in other sectors for various reasons. Um, partly because the government is only prioritising a few and partly because those other sectors are much more diverse. But where we have tried it, it's actually worked pretty well. It started under Mandelson, continued under Cable. There's, there was a bit of a hiatus under Sajid Javid, although the Automotive Council was kept. The underlying interventions were starting to be taken away. And it's, I think, going back to that kind of partnership-type knowledge discovery approach, which is critical. So coming back to your point about a long-term consensus, it's that sort of approach that we've got to keep going. Yeah. That's exactly, exactly right, but I, I'd also add, um, it's not just um, learning about tacit knowledge about particular technologies uh, and um, which particular sectors to su support or whatever, it's also about learning which, partic which particular policies um, are going to be effective and, and um, you know, um, we're in in university and, and universities are often tasked and, and policy think tanks are often tasked to, to evaluate policy and um, we have various quantitative approaches and you have qualitative approaches but often <coughs> these on their own are not enough and, and they can't capture everything. If you think about innovation for instance, it's a, you know, you invest in innovative activities but the in out outputs and in innovation are non-linear and often unmeasurable. So um, I think it's very important if we're, we're talking about policy is to engage with stakeholders over time to learn about policy and to learn which policies have been effective uh, and how they can be changed and altered for transformative policy in the future. So I think that's, a, that's a, an important aside as well as you know, being involved in particular technologies and innovation. And so I think in that regard, you know, building networks uh, of academics, policy makers, and stakeholders, industrialists, um, trade unions, and other other stakeholders, uh, is going to be very very important. Well, um, I wanted. No, sorry. 
Well, I just wanted to ask about, you know, the prioritization also of the sectors would be would be something important. Uh, and I'm not quite sure what kind of sector has been prioritized by the government, because at the end of the day, you're dealing with limited resources. Of course, I agree completely that you have to engage in a process in order to identify the policies. But what, on what criteria are the government is the government going to base? Well, okay, <coughs> well, we need to identify you know, that uh, uh, automotive industry is one of the highest priority sectors versus like innovative application or technologies and, and just concentrate on that. So this kind of trade-off or at least prioritization, how it's, how it's going to be done or if there is a way to do it. Okay, I mean, I, I, uh, I take the point. Um, it was interesting that you characterized in terms of that automotive as against more innovative. Automotive actually is incredibly innovative. So a lot of the technology is coming out of aerospace, it's coming out of related uh, sectors. And you look at this Phoenix industry I was talking about, they, they develop enabling technologies that are used in aerospace, construction, transport, all sorts of different fields. So in part, it's about thinking, well, what are the capabilities we've got and how can we diversify them? And I think often, Phil, you know, we, we heard about smart specialization. I think that's the wrong term. It should be smart diversification because that's what, how it's used in practice. And also, what are the big changes that are coming and opportunities, and how can we harness those in terms of our current capabilities and how we can develop in the future? So one of the things we've done recently, for example, is a project working for Biz, refreshing the technology roadmap that use, is used in automotive to identify the things that are going to hit the industry, where are we strong and we can develop, where are we weak that we need to build more. So it's that kind of technology forecasting, road mapping, that the government needs to do more of. And it comes back to Hugh's point about our chronic intelligence failure in the civil service in London, particularly in the context of big cuts taking place, whereby I'm not convinced that our civil service can actually do that job. So whether we need to try and rebuild that more locally and regionally, I think is an interesting question. Thank you for a wonderful presentation and, you know, and of course your presentation is focusing in Europe, but a quick question in terms of what are the op other opportunities for UK to be engaged other side, outside Europe? Because, you know, uh, we know that there's a partnership and there's a membership, <coughs> but there's Africa and China and, you know, there's other developing countries, uh, Brazil, uh, Russia, so is there, and what, uh, and has there been any study or analysis of what additional opportunities uh, exist for UK? <coughs> this is something that the um, Brexiters make a big deal about in the sense Liam Fox has said he wants to do a trade deal um, with the rest of the world 10 times bigger than the EU. That's a bit problematic because the last time I looked, the EU accounts for 15% of world GDP. So doing something 10 times bigger than the EU is, is a problem. Um, <laughs> clearly, there, there is the opportunity to do trade deals with uh, other parts of the world. We can probably do that more quickly as an individual country than by being part of the EU where you've got to have 28 countries agree on the nature of the trade deal. But there are a number of problems with that. Firstly, we don't really have any trade negotiating experience because the trade negotiators all went to Europe in 1974. Um, now some of them are being brought back. Ironically, we'll have to have quite a bit of net immigration to bring in the expertise to cut the trade deals with other parts of the world. Secondly, are we going to get as good a trade deal than we would have by being part of the EU? I'm very sceptical on that. So yes, we may get trade deals. There is an opportunity. Whether they're going to be any better than by being part of the EU, though, I'm actually quite sceptical. The economists for Brexit, as Phil said, actually were talking about unilaterally giving up trade barriers anyway, and that would probably lead to the loss of our manufacturing base. Now, whereas Minford has been saying we shouldn't worry about that, Actually, I am worried about it, partly because several regions in the UK are still very heavily dependent on manufacturing. And manufacturing, I would argue, is important for the economy. It's important in terms of driving productivity growth, in paying decent wages, in R&D spend, and 80% of our exports are still in manufacturing. Plus, a lot of what happens in the economy is now counted as services, but is linked to manufacturing. So when you look at manufacturing, for example, in the West Midlands, and services linked to it, formally, we're told manufacturing is 12% of the economy. If you look at those linked sectors, it's about 
34, 35% of the economy. Now that isn't right, but it's roughly right. And I think Keynes once said it's better to be roughly right than absolutely wrong. Um, so uh, this, this is still hugely important. So we've got to think very carefully, not only about doing trade deals quickly, but whether it's really going to benefit us or not. Okay, thank you, David. Thank you.